If you ever thought about ditching your nine to five to build your own company and then scale it globally, then you're gonna love today's guest. Welcome, Paulette. Hi, thank you very much for having me, you guys. Yeah, no problem, thank you. Uh, so about 15 years ago, you left your executive role to start a company in the media and entertainment space from your apartment. What led you to make a move like that? I think a lot has to do with who we are as a as people and how we grow grew up and everything. And my childhood has a lot to do with it. And I've mentioned this before in, in other conversations that I've had where my upbringing was hard. Um, you know, I had uh, really thoughtful and dedicated parents, but went through a lot, unfortunately, with financial issues in our household. And my sister and I had, you know, a lot of things that we went through. And so growing up, I always had this mentality that I never wanted to grow up and put my kids through that. Um, and I think, you know, that's what a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs have that it's sort of that that background of wanting to kind of own their own destiny and wanting to kind of really own how things go. And so that bug was always there. Now, the unfortunate situation is, is when is that right opportunity? When is the right time um, to feel that comfort and that okay to do something like that? So that opportunity came up, yes, when I was working at uh, Panasonic, and it was a brand new format called, well, there were two of them, right? Blu-ray and HD DVD. And it was in the middle of what that lovely format war. And I just happened to be in the mix of it. You know, all three of us were. And um, thought, you know what? Why don't I try this? And if I fail, that's okay. I've made enough good connections. I, I feel confident in myself as as a, an employee to go back to work again. And maybe I'll come back to Panasonic with my tail between my legs, uh, begging for work. But at least I tried. Um, I really didn't want to be a little old lady rocking in her chair wondering what if, what if. Um, I, I'd rather fail and, uh, you know, go back than, than not do it at all. So that's what really led me to do it, um, to actually make that jump. But being in the industry and seeing firsthand, you know, where that opportunity was, was I think the, the kicker that kind of like chopped me off right off the cliff there. <laughs> and did you, I, I don't recall, did you make a full time jump into your own business or did you kind of start? doing that on the side at all while you were still in your uh, working at Panasonic? What I did um, was think a lot about what it could be, um, but I actually made the complete jump. So I, I ended on a Friday and started, you know, on Monday, basically. So it was stop and then go. Yeah. And was it because you're like, look, there's a big gap here. Nobody's filling. I'm going to fill it. How, how did that come about? I mean, back then I didn't think huge. I thought just within our industry. And back then it was sort of what I noticed with the way QC, because we started off as a QC company, was that QC reports were sent back and forth on Word documents or PDF documents and emailed. And, you know, being in project management in the area where we were talking to the clients, I mean, it was not really a collaborative way of, of communicating. And so I thought, oh my God, there needs to be like an online system that people can log in and collaborate with. And, you know, doing QC is a, is a thing. So that was sort of the, the thought process on there where that gap was. Uh, granted, there were a lot of issue tracking systems in the industry already, but mostly dealing with software or different types of industries. I, I really wanted to focus on building something specifically for our little, our little industry that we had, our little big industry. Right. I, I, but and so I'm so curious to there because to make that leap now, you didn't think at first like, OK, because it sounds like you needed to build some of these solutions. So when you jumped in, call it on Monday, was that you jumping in building solutions or did you basically already say, hey, uh, customers, I'm open for business and just build as you go along to that bigger promise for like a better way or better solution? Great question. So I I think, and I'm not remembering the exact date, but I think it was December 7th of 2007 that I officially started the company. So it was during the holiday. So there wasn't any opportunity to go get clients or anything. So I used the whole month of December plus January when and I went to CES was when I first started having meetings with clients. But that whole December, I built the system. So the system uh, was called, it was really a creative name. It was called ORS for Online Reporting System. <laughs> um, 
was really creative. I just thought, well, I'm going to go big on this. So that I spent that whole month doing it. So it, it launched in, in January. Well, I mean, we were our only users of it, but officially we were kind of ready to go. And during that time period, I also developed some strategic relationships with existing QC companies that weren't in Blu-ray. And that's how that whole thing started. It went really fast. I look back on it. I don't know how it happened, but it happened. And it worked out very well with, with great people and everything. When did you... Uh start hiring people was it waiting for revenue or raising money like how, how did you go about were that? you qcing behind the scenes yeah you know what i yeah, yeah. I, I i was qcing um hired i think the first really official person was in december january was sort of like my, my gm or my right hand sort of from a business standpoint kind of looking at it that way um, we did try to go for funding initially so i was i i hired someone that i worked with previously in the industry um, outside of the home entertainment. Um, and he came on and uh, it was very tough to raise money for an industry that no one really understood, especially with the format war not being finished or completed yet. It's like, why are you calling yourself Blue Focus on Blu-ray? You're kind of putting all your eggs in one basket. And it, it, was, uh, it wasn't a very easy sell to investors. So we, we did this with no investment at all whatsoever. But our first official hires probably came in March. So it happened, again, really quickly. But it was all self-funded. What was your thought process? So if if it did turn out that HD DVD was going to win, would have you changed the name or would have you just said Blue Focus and made it work? You know, at that time, I just felt like I knew because the whole thing was like Sony wasn't going to let this one go. So it, it seemed to me pretty much like, you know, Blu-ray was, was going to be the winner, even though it was like, it just makes sense. People understand HD DVD better and it's a bigger, you know, it holds more and all that. It's just the gut feeling was like it, you know, Go big or go home. So I put just go for it, right? Be a hundred percent into one thing and see what happens. So what what would you say were the biggest challenges in that first year or two as you are barely starting? Um, cash flow. I mean, having the cash, you know, uh, the stress of retaining, you know, getting your name out there and well known, especially in a in a sea of other competitors. Now at this time, I didn't go to business school, so really all I had was an idea and the passion to succeed. Right. That, that's all I had. I, I knew what I was good at um, and I wanted to surround myself by others that did really good at that and then go out to clients who are in need of this. I didn't put any thought into the business aspects of oh competitor analysis and, and look at that landscape of all that. Nothing at all whatsoever. Um, and so I think that was the, the difficult part was getting submerged in that and realizing, why oh God, there's a sea of politics that I was completely unprepared for and caught me off guard. Because I was like, all I want to do is just do QC and do these reports in my my little ORS system. I didn't realize the stuff that, that I don't think I could have ever prepared myself for. So that was hard and uh, dealing with that. And I think in June, I started developing heart palpitations uh, from the stress and probably drinking too much coffee and Red Bull at the same time. Um, so it's a combination of stuff. But it, but it obviously, I think, starting any business, it's it's very, very difficult. And it started taking a toll on me internally. Um, but it, it was a tough road. So the hardest part, I mean, the biggest challenge was, I think, were the, the politics involved with everything, um, which I just wasn't prepared for that. And that's something I don't know how you can ever prepare yourself for. Did you ever think about quitting? No. No. I, I, I think entrepreneurs have that sort of thing and I, I don't put much thought into it, but I, I see like a, a wall and I my brain automatically thinks of how to overcome it. And uh, my poster that I sit here is the key to success is playing the hand you were dealt like it's the hand that you wanted. And I think it's a, it's a mind shift because when you, when you get into a position where you sulk and you kind of fall, you could fall into a deep hole and then you're not moving anywhere. Right. You're just stuck with regret and stuck in a place of just wishing, oh, what if, what if, what if? And that doesn't help anything. So I, I for myself, it's like, OK, be upset about something in a moment, scream, yell, do what you need to do and then figure something else out and just move forward and look at it a different way. When you dove into it and um, by the way, I, I just what you said there, I'm like, I need that quote <laughs> over here, too. I think that's great. Look at. But. When you had mentioned that you knew, um, all right, if this didn't work out, you could always go, you know, back to that. Did you have a certain amount of time you were giving yourself or was there a certain amount of runway? Because obviously financially you had to support yourself as you grew this business. So what did that look like for you? No, I just went all in. 
the, the lucky thing for me is that I, I wasn't married at the time. I didn't have kids. And so it was it was easier for me not to have that that plan, um, that definite plan. OK, I need to stop by this time because I could live off of a cup of noodles or something, you know, and, and I could it could make a way through it without having to think about that too much. But no, I was gung ho like this was going to work. And that was another thing at the mindset. It was like it, the, what failure wasn't an option for me. Failing at certain things like steps along the way. OK, but overall. It, it it wasn't uh, it wasn't an option. How many years did it take to mentally feel like you were going from this early startup and every day might be a challenge, cash flow is an issue, to a place where you're like, we got this now. Like uh, it's not as those things are not as stressful anymore. There's new problems, but those early startup things are way behind us. I'll let you know when I get there. <laughs> <laughs> I still feel like a startup by, you know, it's, um, it's sort of that feeling. It's kind of like we're getting older, but I still feel like I'm in my twenties, right? It's, it's sort of like when your body saw everything different. So I still feel this, the same way. Um, and I think problems, the same issues are always there. They just change, um, in terms of, you know, our cash flow issues back then for payroll where it was this amount. Now it's obviously a lot larger and everything, but it's still the same, same problem, right? It's still the same issue. Um, revenue, looking to increase revenue. Any business has to grow. Diversification, going into different service areas, looking at what's needed in the industry and having to pivot and change with those needs. It, those are the same exact problems that always, and not problems, they're opportunities that keep coming up, but they just change in, in how big they are and how small they are but they're always going to be there. Um, but every day when I walk into the office, I still stop and kind of go, this is cool. You know, like we built this and everything. And it, it, it's, a, it's a good feeling. That's awesome. Did you, when you did build it initially, because I know you mentioned not having the, you know, um, uh, background and experience for lack of a better way to put it, jumping into building an entire business, which sometimes might be good because then you're not getting in your own way of all. I think a lot of people do that. They come up and they say, oh, well, I I'd have to figure this out. I have to figure that out. But it still looks like you did go into it with the mentality that you weren't necessarily looking small because when you brought in that partner on it um, or, or first hire, you know, it's like you were thinking about it in terms of um, how do you raise and bring in money. So did you see it? I know at the time it was QC, but did you see it growing to what it became today or was that just you solving problem after problem? Yeah, I mean, I, I look back and obviously I wouldn't change a thing because it's where I am now, but I look back and see wow, holes and things I shouldn't have, I should have done, right? I look back and realize, okay, QC, I mean, that that's not being in this one little niche. I mean, that's not a, a, a long play there. Um, but at the time, yeah, I was solving for a problem that existed in that moment. And any business school or taking anything, you solve problems, yes, taking into account what's today, but you're looking forward to make sure that, you know, your company has longevity and everything. Um all honesty, I wasn't at the time. At the time, I was I was looking at something where I could own my thing, have a lifestyle that I could support myself, control my my destiny in a certain way, and I wasn't thinking gigantic back then. Um, so yeah, me back then, if I had to go talk to myself, I would have done things differently. But then at the same time, no, I wouldn't have done things because it all worked out. So, <laughs> did you find that you um, what you were seeking in terms of? kind of some of the freedom, uh, I'd say the time, I mean, it's again, all subjective of how you see it, but did you find that you hit those fairly soon or did it take you a while before you felt that, or do you still not feel it? Feel, feel what exactly? Feel that what you were seeking to achieve initially with some of that freedom, with some of that, you know, um, uh, you know, doing, working on what you wanted to work on. Like, do you think like what you initially set out for, are you like, huh, I got there in three years or instead of you're like, I'm still not there because I keep seeing you know, a, 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 a horizon coming, but it's not there yet. You know, I, I think as entrepreneurs too, we're never satisfied. There's this song by the band Metric that I love in their lyrics is, is it ever going to be enough? And it, it always rings in my head to think, okay, you, you get to this point and then you want this, right? The grass is always greener, right? I could always have another house or something, you know, you want to move somewhere else. So I think for me, it's every time I would achieve a goal, I can't control it. Your mind kind of just wants to see how more, and it's about yourself. It's like to see what I'm capable of doing, um, uh, achieving more of that sense. So 
I got to a point, I think, after the first year where I felt like, oh, wow, I have a real company. This is something for real. And I was proud of that moment. But I always kept wanting to see how the company could evolve. Great people. What else could we achieve? How could we continue to move forward? How could we expand what we were doing? And so it never ends. It never stops. And I'm still not there. It's it's sort of like, what else can I do? As long as I'm having fun and a good time and I like the people that I'm working with, then I'll just keep going. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I start out by saying that you you scale the company globally, but just so we can appreciate it. Can you just share with us how big is the company now and where are you located globally? Well, we're located in eight uh, locations around the world. So we have our offices in Mexico, here in Burbank, in Hollywood, um, in France, Spain, in Athens, Greece, in Denmark, and in London. Wow. And so we're about about 200 employees. Wow. Uh, worldwide. And so, yeah. Impressive. And thank you. As far as, you know, the type of people you're hiring, I can imagine early days, you're probably very hands-on with the hiring decisions. As you've gone to 200, you probably can't be as hands-on. So what, was there anything you've uh, put into place to keep hiring people that are aligned with the goal or kind of have a cultural fit? Like how have you gone about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I try to be involved as much as possible, especially in roles that have, you know, a, a big say or a big part of sort of how the companies run. I, I am involved in those still. And I want to continue that because I feel like that's really important for people to know who I am, um, how the company started, what what we stand for, what we're trying to achieve here as a, as a, as a group. Um, but ensuring that they understand kind of who I am too allows them to instill that culture into them so that when they hire the people they need to, it kind of resonates and it kind of falls through as well. So it is, it is important for culture when, uh, in the company is, it's a, one of the most important things, if it's not the most important thing. And it's something that I learned when I took uh, my lovely organizational leadership class at getting my MBA. It was the most fascinating part. Everything else, zeros and ones, very strict on the book and everything, but organizational behavior and leadership was amazing to me about how important it is um, to ensure that company culture resonates throughout the entire organization and how, how much that, how impactful that is with how the companies run and the, so, the goals and the successes that it's going to have. So it is something that we, we, we really do focus on. You mentioned it, the MBA there. When did you end up getting your MBA? I ended up getting it in 2014 or 15 at, from Pepperdine University. Yeah, I went back to school because um, I wanted to, to be able to get that. And it was a lot of work, but it was, uh, I love it. So you were you were running a company um, while getting your MBA. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> well, unlike most, you, we were probably able to put into that, that theories into practice like the next day. Yeah. See, so luckily I took the president key executives program at Pepperdine and that is for owners or those are key executives of companies. So your, your whole, the whole thing is on your own company. So it was, that's amazing. It was exactly what you're saying. It was, it, I put it into practice and it was part of the whole thing. So I, it was, it was really cool. <laughs> like being in a mastermind of some sort. Did you make a lot of connections there too? With, Cause I assume were people doing a similar like stage in their business or. Um, yeah, some were starting some everything, but they were totally different industries. And the beauty of that was, was to find out that other people have the exact same problems. So it, it didn't matter. It was all the same thing. Growth, cash flow, people, you know, it was all the same thing. It's just, you're in a different industry and we all had the same problems and same successes and everything. So made a lot of friendships. It was really cool. Speaking of growth, when did you know you were ready to go out for professional money and raise funding? I think it was sort of when um, I felt like I was driving a Ferrari in a parking lot. You know, I felt like we had something really good, but I needed to get out onto that, that road. And there weren't enough hours in the day. And I didn't physically have that capability anymore of staying up and not sleeping. <laughs> um, I, I needed help. I needed to build my executive team. It was the one thing that I, you know promoted within, had great people that worked with me who helped me get where I am. And I'm grateful for every single person that has, has been with the company. But there was a point when if we needed to get to the next level, I, I needed to bring on 
an executive team that could teach me because it was still a lot for me to learn. Um, granted, I never was a high executive at corporations before, right? Um, and so a lot of these things I was learning and I just got my MBA and everything. So I needed to hire smart people that could really excel in the areas that they could excel in. And, you know, the first thing I started off with was my CFO. That was really important. Um, and then moved on from from there and everything and hired an executive team. But that also meant I needed to go out for funding. And so I felt like we had achieved the goals that that we needed to and were successful. And we went out for, for our Series A in 2019. And we closed that in 2020, 2021. I, can you share some kind of more tactical details around like, how did you go about finding people that are willing to write you a check? Um, great question. Again, um, I had no clue. So I did a lot of Googling and I saw, you know, angel investors and all these places and you could submit something. And it was literally, I didn't understand. Um, but I had someone in the industry introduce me to a firm that, that was basically investment brokers. And their job was to go out and broker these deals and everything. And so that's how I, I did it. We had her do the pitch deck, the whole data room with all the financials and everything. Again, I'm learning. I'm learning all this stuff. And I know that my first pitch was the worst. I left my first uh, pitch with a potential investor with my head hanging so low. I sat in that car and I was just so depressed because I messed up. Because the, the initial thing when you try to pitch is you try to go into your story of who you are and all this. And no, investors just, where are you going? Where is it? What problem are you solving? Yep. <laughs> How much are we going to make? That's it. And I'm going, nah, da, 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 this is me. And um, every pitch got better and better and better. I mean, it was very bad at first. And until I, and then I went and took another class on pitches, on how to do pitches ended up winning that one amongst the group and everything, which gave me a lot of confidence. And that was actually the pitch that ended up being used for the the first investor that we closed. So um, I practiced and practiced. But as far as technical details, man, I had an investment broker and it was a lot, a lot of uh, conversations. Did you have your CFO at that point or not yet? No, it was all on my own. It was all on my own. Yeah, so you were doing all the, you know, forecasting everything that you needed to be able to sell this dream. Yeah. Yeah. With a lot of hats, my neck. Still hurt. <laughs> talk about, uh, talk about learning on the job. <laughs> exactly. 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 Did you always have that, I don't know, sensibility to where you would just jump into something and figure it out? Or at this point was it because you were so deep into it. And I, I asked that because I think it's something a lot of people do um, struggle with. And it sounds like one of the key differentiators between the success you did have, because you did just say, I'm leaping and I'll figure it out as I move along. So curious to just hear a little bit more on your thoughts on that. I think a lot has to do with confidence in yourself as well. And I felt confident that if I didn't know how to do something, I could figure it out. You know, maybe I wouldn't be a master at it, but I could figure it out enough to comprehend what I was talking about and I, enough for me to find someone that can help me. So I never felt like there was not a way to do something because I knew I could, I could figure out something. Um, and so that was always okay. It's not so simple, but I think it's so, I mean, that's, that's still how so many people. It's fear. You know, I, one time my, my sister-in-law told me when we had a, a barbecue at home and she came up to me and she said, you know, I'm, she just stopped me randomly. And she just said, you know, a lot of people have the thought or the will to do something. The difference between them and you is you actually just go and do it. And I, I guess so. I, I never thought of it that way. It sounds so simple and everything, but I think I just do it and I deal with whatever consequences from it. But I mean, I don't just do anything without thought. I It's calculated risks, right? And everything. But I think that is what entrepreneurs do is they go off and they're not, they don't have that fear of failing. You know, and as long as they, they, they have a good head on their shoulders and it's not doing something like, I'm not going to go promise someone, hey, I can build a rocket ship to the moon. Okay. That, that's ludicrous, right? You know, you don't make, you don't make, uh, you know, claims or something that is something that you can't do. So everything I think I felt like I could figure out how to do. I was going to say, Elon Musk might say the rocket ship is completely I was gonna, not crazy. <laughs> what are you talking about? Moon? What are you talking like, about? Come on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. But I'm with you. I think, yeah. 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 Um, would you say your leadership style has changed as you've been learning on the job? 
uh, or has it stayed the same throughout the 15 years? And what is your leadership style? Oh, no, it, it's changed. And now we'll, we'll go deep into me personally. I am 100% an introvert. Um, I think I had resting face. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's sorry that people would... When they'd see me, they'd think you're just not having a good time. And I never, I said, oh, no, I, that's just how I look. <laughs> that's not what I, what I mean at all. Um, and that's not good for someone who owns a company. And when I first started it, I wasn't aware of this. I, I just, um, not an outwardly social person. And so I remember an employee coming up to me and it sticks with me. This is like, I would say 12 years ago and saying, hey, you know, this person walked by you in the hallway and they said hello to you and you didn't say hello back. And I was like, oh my God, I would never do that. Like, that's just not something that I would purposely do. But it made me realize and become more self-aware um, that who I am and, and I need to, to be more aware of how I'm being and how I'm acting. Um, and I wasn't like that before. Before I just felt like, you know, you do your job and you just move on and everything like that. Not realizing how important that goes back to the leadership style, the organizational behavior classes that I took and everything. I have completely changed. And I think, you know, again, I talked to this for Amy Cuddy, changed me that TED talk. If you've watched it, you know, fake it till you make it, fake it till you become it. I did fake it. And it, and I went through this period of time of feeling I had imposter syndrome because I felt like I'm this introvert and I'm, I'm pretending to be social because I don't want to come off as not uh, empathetic or being polite and everything. It's just how I am. But I kept being this way until it just changed me. And 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 it, and it took this time to go through and everything. But how I am as a leader, night and day, completely night and day, where I used to think it was just about the work that you do. And now I realized, no, it's it's the journey and the people that you're with and, and that compatibility and having that common goal that communication, that collaboration, that's the most important thing. You know, it's interesting, as you mentioned, that um, individual passing you and how that was a big, you know, turning point for you. I'm sure in your head, you were solving 15 problems at the time for the company. That's yeah. still really, yeah. <laughs> but for that person, yeah. here they were having their, you know, their their moment. And it's like, yeah, it's it's so crazy how these little things can be so impactful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. You know, earlier we talked about how you start the company as uh, Blue Focus, and investors were like, "You can't just call it Blue Focus because what if uh, Blue Ray doesn't win?" So, what's the company called now, and what services outside of QC are you offering? Yeah, so we officially changed the name to Blue Digital Group in I think February of 2020, and yeah, now now we're not just QC. QC is still part of our business; is still our DNA um, of quality control. Um, on everything that we do. So we also do digital services, everything from transcoding to editing, et cetera. And we also do localization work. And then our biggest one, that software that I started off, the ORS, um, has is now its own little division here where we actually license our software out. Um, that is called Blue Conductor. So we have a whole licensing arm that does software licensing in the cloud. Um, and that's funny because that was the beginning of the company and how it started. So it's really kind of cool and full circle. And does blue still represent blue as it did before? And now is it like blue ocean strategy? Like what is blue now? Perfect. Exactly. I kept blue. Blue, you know, is a, is a great name for blue ocean strategy, crisp, clear, everything. It, it felt like it just it blue skies. It, it did um, totally stayed with us and everything. It's both inspiring and, and impressive just to hear that journey. And how resourceful you've been to, to figure out stuff. Uh, it's pretty incredible. A quick question too. I'm curious, when you mentioned um, just some of the growth um, globally, is is that mainly around the localization or is components of that like some of the software side of it? Like wh what's driven most of the global growth or just where customers are? So kind of, you know, what makes us very unique is what we've built with Conductor is the ability to do things fully in the cloud. And so we're able to offer our services and our software globally. And so each one of these arms are project management and service operators, but really leveraging our cloud-based systems so that we can expand a lot faster and be more scalable globally. So that that's really, it is offering all services that we do. So every location provides that menu. Is it more of a customer service component that's on staff there? Or do you like have, is there a specific country where you've hired 
more of your um, engineers for developing of, you know, conduct or like what's like, how does that get spread out when you look at your global footprint? Yeah. So all, all locations will have either customer service, business development, some accounting, obviously for accounting reasons in every territory. And then we do have operations there as well, but we don't have to, to build out fully as we do in every location because we get to utilize all the resources around the world. Yeah. Your company started based on uh, the notion of software can make things better. And now you lean into software a lot more. What's your thought on Gen AI and where do you see the future going uh, in general and specifically with your company? Where, where is that coming to play? Uh, we're getting closer to Skynet every day. Uh, it, it's, we have to embrace this new technology. It's coming no matter what. I see a lot of, you know, a lot of hesitation on there, a lot of concerns, which I, I understand. Um, so the way we're utilizing it is, is sort of to complement what we're doing from a human perspective. I think it doesn't have to be completely the extreme way of replacing humans. I think it can complement uh, just the same way as, you know, as, as big periods in our, in our history where new jobs are going to come up from this, jobs that we can't even fathom or think of right now. So I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities that are going to stem from generative AI that's going to be coming in that we just haven't thought about yet. So I'm in, we're embracing it. We're looking at it. How can it complement what we do? How can it do things that we can't do? Um, but I, I don't think it has to be the extreme um, that a lot of people are fearful of because there are a lot, there's a lot of fear there. Yeah, I, I would agree. It. Yeah, me too. I'm excited about it. Um, excited, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking back to yourself of the 15, 20 years ago, what advice do you have for somebody that's an aspiring entrepreneur and founder that was in your shoes 15, 20 years ago? I, you know, I've, I've been asked this question a lot. And I think one of the best ones that I can give is expect things not to go the way you expect them to go. I think, and, and the reason why is because that's the core of any entrepreneur is that you can do a business plan, you can do everything. But it's going to be your mindset and how you handle the situations that come up that don't go as planned. And so I think at the core, you have to be okay with things not going the way you planned them to go. And if you can get that down, then I think everything else will be okay. Great advice. Uh, right. To kind of round this amazing conversation off, where can our listeners find you? Uh, online, everywhere. I'm. Uh, we're on Twitter. <laughs> we're on. No, oh, sorry. X. <laughs> <laughs> easy, easy. Yeah. X. We're on X. We're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll make sure to link out to those uh, social media profiles when when the episode is released. So, uh, I don't know, Mike. Anything else? Uh, parting words? No, just uh, congrats on the success. It's been really interesting to watch. Um, you know, and have a somewhat of a front row seat. Maybe I was slightly up in the bleachers a little bit, but to see, you know, work with you when you were project managing, I think even, you know, even before, yeah, it's like incredible to see where you are now and what you've created. So again, just, just bravo, uh, super exciting. And you your wisdom here, I think was, is going to be incredible for people who are starting that journey or considering that journey. So thank you. Great. We've, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know. Uh, We've grown up together in this industry, I feel like. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we sure have. Yeah, well, th thanks again. Uh, and whoever is watching and listening, don't forget to subscribe and follow and share this episode because I think Paula shared some amazing insights that you want to share them with others. So thanks again. We'll see you in the next one.